as you walked out the door of the airplane, the heat just sucked your breath away. The first thing you noticed was the heat. It looked like a wall of just heat coming through there because of the heat and humidity. Basically getting off the plane it was super hot. You know. It was hot, humid, and it smelled funny. It's very hot, very humid, and rains every day. Wait a minute, that's where I live in Florida. So I was born and raised in this little town, Malone, New York. It's uh, way up north, uh, just shy of the Quebec border in Canada. Mm -hmm. Small town of Mannheim, Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. In a little city called Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, it's in the western part of Massachusetts. Uh, Hillside, New Jersey, a, a small town within sight of the uh, Empire State Building. Uh, it was a fairly well-to-do town, but uh, my family was very poor. I grew up in the southern Missouri Ozarks, a little town called Reynolds in Reynolds County. Birmingham, uh, south of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I grew up in uh, Buffalo, New York. Grew up in Wisconsin, uh, a rural uh, farming, farming country. I grew up in the city of Tonawanda, which is a suburb of Buffalo, New York. Uh, I graduated in 1964 with a class of about 300. I grew up during World War II and saw all the, the World War II movies, and that was always in the back of my mind. I'd go off on a tangent to be a ballet dancer when I never had dancing class, to be an archaeologist, but I kept coming back to the military. And by the time of my senior year of college, that's what I wanted to do. My, my dad was Air Force, and uh, um, so I just followed in his tradition. Made him feel proud. Got one of those, got one of those handshakes, you know. And Dad, I joined the Air Force, so I get the handshake. Several of my classmates um, were going in the Air Force, so we went in what was called a buddy flight, and uh, which meant we stayed together through basic training. Once I got out of high school, I said I've got to go somewhere and do something with my life. And I got messed up with the wrong people doing the wrong things. And I said, you know, I need to reinvent myself. This is what the military does for you. Well, in Southern Missouri, there's not a lot of uh, job opportunities. So it was pretty much the thing to do if you were 17 or 18 and facing the draft at some point in time to, to enlist in the Air Force. Uh, but I went to school, I decided I wanted to become a funeral director. So I went to school in New York City to become a funeral director. And while I was doing that, Uncle Sam said, hey, we think we want you. So uh, uh, I got a deferment until I finished and got my license. But uh, then I went, uh, I signed up, went in the Army, went to Mortuary Affairs. Um, actually, it was called Graves Registration at that time. My father was in World War II, and he was in France right after D-Day. My one of my other uncles served at the Battle of the Bulge, and he survived. And I have an uncle who was a pilot in World War II who was at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. And he was one of the only seven aircraft to get off the ground. Basic training was in July of 1966 in San Antonio, Texas, and it was extremely hot. Basic training was uh, quite miserable. Uh, uh, San Antonio, Texas in uh, the months of July and August is not the place you want to be. You know, they had, we had three instructors. We had the good guy, bad guy, and then we had the guy that tried to, uh, you know, keep peace in the family. <laughs> I didn't ever look at it as difficult. I was, again, 17, 18 years old. Pretty good shape for a young fella. Uh, so the physical part of it was really not a big deal for me. Uh, in fact, I kind of excelled in it. Uh, the discipline, however, you know, you, you get used to that with somebody in your face 24-7. It was difficult, but it was really nothing. It was just more like just getting you into shape mentally. But it, it wasn't difficult, no. Hot. <laughs> Lackland Air Force Base at San Antonio. For getting there in the end of June 
in the pre-air conditioning days. It was interesting. It was not, in some ways, it was not as difficult as I thought it was going to be. And then after that was over, I went into what they called advanced basic training. It was eight weeks of basic training, followed by 18 weeks of tech school at Wichita Falls, Texas, at Shepard Air Force Base. Flying training, ground training, intense math about how to uh, uh, do what GPS does for you all the time now, and that is to, to uh, uh, use the stars and the sun and, and uh, radio aids and all this to figure out where you are in the, in the world. And I had a letter from my niece who wrote about your glamorous career. And there I'd been on my hands and knees scraping soap with a razor in the shower stall with the sweat just pouring off. And I think, glamorous? <laughs> Somehow I missed that. My first duty assignment was at England Air Force Base in Louisiana. I was assigned there to the 834th Air Police Squadron. And I went to uh, my first duty station and I wanted to get away from home. I didn't want any part of New England. So they stayed, I came from Rhode Island. They stationed me in New Hampshire, which was an hour away from my house. The Air Force in its infinite wisdom assigned me to McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, 70 miles from home. Now I enlisted to get away from New Jersey and to go away from the people I had been associating with. And now I'm 70 miles from home. First duty assignment was at Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas from 1967 to 1969. It was very interesting. I was at the official title in the Air Force was Chaplain Services Specialist or Chaplain's Assistant. It was more or less an administrative job. There were maybe half a dozen female officers on the base, maybe a little bit more. 10 maximum, and only one my age. She was six weeks behind me in officer training school. So we did a lot of things together. Coming out of a rural farm, farm area and uh, sharing a room with a, with a couple brothers and that kind of thing, having, having a big barracks with lots of people, it was, wasn't, wasn't so bad. The, shower, the water was hot all the time for the most part. Oh yes, the uh, inspection, you know, daily inspection as far as just the routine, uh, everything's tight, you know, then we had walkthroughs by command. It was a, a new, an extension of a family that I had left at home, but now on a different level. Uh, but uh, no, uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed it, and the longer I was in, the more and more I enjoyed it. We were all basically the same age, and. Uh, same interests, and uh, it was a nice place to grow up. I was 17 years old, and you either grew up or you didn't. Oh, I enjoyed it. I really did. Uh, everybody complains about the food, the, uh, the maybe the people you work for, that kind of thing. But for me, I enjoyed it. I re-enlisted once. So after being there about 10 months, I went to see my first sergeant. And I told him I was unhappy in New Jersey because I wanted to travel and see the world. And he said, the greatest places that use ground radio operators are on the dew line in Canada and Alaska. He said, you know what that is? I said, I think so. He said, it's a line of radar stations. There's no women, there's no alcohol, and there's no towns. I said, first sergeant, I'm 20 years old. He said, well, you could go to Vietnam. Things are heating up over there and you could get hurt or killed, but there's women and there's beer and there's towns. I said, I want to go to Vietnam. I volunteered to go to Vietnam to get out of Texas. The arriving in Vietnam, the first thing that happened was when we were landing, they landed very steeply and the pilot let us know it was a commercial flight, but the reason they took a steep landing was because we could be taking enemy fire and we needed to get on the ground as quickly as possible. So I could have gone to Vietnam a year later after my husband. I was the first group of Air Force female non-volunteers going to Vietnam. And they said we could delay it for a year, but then you'll be going when your husband comes back and that would be a two year separation. 
and I, my medical rec my medical shots, my passport, and my orders are all dated the same day, December 26, 1961. And they put us on planes to, and eventually wound up in Tonsonut. And the colonel waiting for us at Tonsonut had a couple choice words because he didn't know we were coming. And that's the way the Tonsonut, which is some of these other gentlemen I'm sure told you were 40, 50,000 people. There was about 200 there when I got there. So we helped set up Tonsonut. So I was, I was technically the first, if you want to call it combat, they called it combat trade. It was a little advanced, probably the Army's advanced combat military training that they do too, though. So that's what we did. It was hard. That was, that was made basic training look like kids play. And, uh, but it was well worth it. And they put us over in Vietnam and I was at Tonsonut Air Base and got assigned to the, they call it Alpha Sector, which was protecting the perimeter of the base. Uh, I went over there at the big buildup after Teta 68. I ended up at Tonsonut Air Base. There, they had Tonsonut had been attacked, so they they were beefing up the personnel there. So I had re-enlisted, and I had experience from Thailand, so I went. Landed in uh, Cameron Bay the first time I came in, and uh, we spent about ten days there, and it was Tet was just coming off. Tet of 68 was just kind of ending. And they were telling us Cameron Bay is the safest place in the country because of the mountains around it. And, but they said, if you hear sirens, get out of your bunk and go into ditches. So, and that happened every night. So we were getting mortared every night anyway. So We, we did the per perimeter protection and the interior protection. And essentially the idea was that we would hold the base if we were attacked for 12, 12 to 18 hours, and then the Army or the Marines would, would come as a quick response and relieve us. But we were, we were the uh, Air Force's uh, Army at that particular point in time. We were primarily flying, flying on uh, C-123s and C-130s, and uh, we were f taking fuel to the Army and Marine helicopter posts that could not get fuel any other way, either by land or truck. And uh, of course, uh, interesting life. Uh, it was a very rare day that you didn't get shot at. Um, it was real quiet then. Things were just heating up. Uh, we lived in a tent. TDY people lived in a 12-man tent with pallets for the floor, cold showers. I worked in the uh, refrigeration shop in Civil Engineers. I fixed um, air conditioners and refrigeration equipment at the chow halls, maintained, maintained the equipment. We get a call from, usually from, from the Air Force saying that we have a plane coming in and uh, we have remains on it. So we'd go out to the planes, uh, unload the remains from there, bring them back to the mortuary. Some of the collecting points were close enough that they were driving by truck, and so we'd get them there. Um, they built us a helipad right where uh, the big mortuary was, and uh, we had uh, Huey helicopters come in. A couple times we had uh, Chinook helicopters come in, and they usually carried a couple dozen uh, remains at a time. So I could not leave Saigon because of my security clearances, and John had to travel, and he flew at night. He flew gunships. And you could fly to a outpost that's in trouble or a village that's in trouble, uh, uh, U.S. Army in the field. South Vietnamese forces in the field that, that need some fire support at night, especially at night. They tried it during the daytime and airplanes kept getting shot at and shot down. I originally had been assigned to a fighter squadron at his base 20 miles away, but the commander didn't want a woman talking to his crew members. And uh, despite the fact that I didn't particularly want Carol to go uh, while I was there, uh, uh, they said, well, too bad. Uh, we have now started to take uh, Air Force personnel, female, over to Vietnam, uh, non-volunteer. It had been volunteer up to that point. Uh, he had to have two or three days off to make sure he could get down the 20 miles, see me and get back and still not be late. <laughs> yeah. We had some interesting times. The chaplain and myself got connected with a 
school of Vietnamese children on base and we had them over at our installation two different times to sing for us and we all enjoyed that and I'm the the gentleman there certainly enjoyed seeing the school teacher because she was a beautiful Vietnamese lady. That's all for that question. They had, they had strange things going on. Every night as the sun went down, bats would fly around and things of that nature. And I was sitting on a bunker one night and I had my helmet on and I got knocked right off the bunker. A bat flew right into my helmet, hit, hit me right in the helmet. So there, there are funny things that happen and there are other things. Um, and then I would work in the initial, they called it the initial ID lab where um, we would bring the guys in, put them on a table to uh, check for uh, well, any organs might be on them, uh, but we checked for scars, uh, anything that might identify them. We did fingerprints, um, marked down any kind of tattoos they might have had or anything like that. If we couldn't get fingerprints, we, were, we would do dental records. Um, I changed the way I thought about things and how I lived after the Tet Offensive, meaning that I actually lived right in a bunker um, at night after the Tet Offensive. Uh, we had a few, few rocket attacks that didn't come close to us in uh, but, you know, we were all, you know, put on alert. We had to go to our bunkers and get all of our gear. Uh, sometimes they would say just throw in two or three mortars every other night at different times of the night just to keep you on your feet, you know, keep you so you couldn't sleep. You know, it just was almost psychological, you know, but with a, you know, very real uh, component to it. We'd get mortars come in every so often. and. We were right by a perimeter, so where they had moved us, and uh, you know, so and we were close to the flight line, so things usually bounced over our heads, and, and uh, you know, they were trying to hit the flight line. But during rocket attacks, and that happened the first after I was there for about a month, and we did not have a bunker for the women. Some of the unit was going on TDY temporary duty up country to Da Nang, and. We were hit the night before they were supposed to deploy. And I remember that all we did was dive under our beds because we had no idea what else to do and what was really happening. It was a very new experience for us. What kept me going was that uh, Carol was there. She was sharing the same experiences that I was in a sense. She was on one air base, I was on another. What kept me going was we're close in a lot of ways, and that, including that. We were sharing the same basic experiences. So I, I wanted to keep going in order to justify being with her, for one thing, and to get a life afterwards. Being with people that you grow close to because you're working with them and you're um, living with them. Well, I'd have to go back to my religion, my faith in God. Yeah, that's... My, my mother taught me well, and it, it came through in the pinch. You think about home. You think about just getting home, and you count your days while you're there to get out. You were nervous, I mean, when you were taking fire. I mean, most time it was not real bad. I mean, it was, we were high enough that it was doing minimal damage. But uh, the times that it did do damage, you, you, know, you were nervous. But, uh, you know, you, you had your religious faith, you had a good airplane, good pilot, and you lived to fly another day. It's a, it's a tough uh, MOS to be in. Uh, it's rewarding if you, you know, I mean, I always felt good that I, my, my job was always a win-win. It wasn't, uh, I didn't have to go out and kill somebody, and you know, everything that was against what you're brought up to do. So uh, I felt fortunate that way. I was very idealistic, and I still am now. I was over there for a reason. I volunteered to go to Vietnam. I, I, I joined the Air Force to wear the uniform, and if there was a conflict going on, I wanted to be there. So after one, one, fire, one or two firefights and, and things were not looking good, I just, I just wanted to get out. So uh, I was fortunate because I, I, I went to combat school with, with three 
three fairly close friends and got in a firefight and lost them all. And then I did, when I decided to stay, uh, tried to stay there, they put me on a permanent post. And when I came home six months later was, was Tet and that post got overrun and every man got killed. I wouldn't be here today. I think that leaving the military, the decision was um, a lot to do with the Tet Offensive, um, probably tied in with losing my father because there were times uh, earlier when I thought I might career and um, I just made the decision that it was time to move on and do something else. The reason I got out of the military is they never asked me to re-enlist. And there was no rank uh, promotion possibilities in the, in the active duty because they were downsizing. Everything in Vietnam was being downsized and they were, they were looking for people to get out rather than re-enlist. It was, it was time for me to get out too. I, I just felt they had done enough time to get out so so I came directly home after that probably because of the war it was not something I wanted to do continue I came back to the states and I had a, about 10 months left to do when I came back and I spent that at Westover Air Force Base in Massachusetts uh, I had 25 years and uh, I could only legally stay another three and my husband had retired and was working as a civilian in the Defense Intelligence Agency. So, and if I had to leave, I didn't want to leave Washington. So the time had come. So I, I got out and uh, went back home and started my uh, education and family. And uh, that, that was the thing to do. They had lined us up and, get, and told us there's, there's, there's five, six, uh, tables out, out there in the hallway. When you hit the last table, you're out. The military gave me the tools to get out of poverty and hunger and make something of myself. I was reinvented by the military. There are a lot of things I didn't like about the military, but the quality that everyone had was a really big thing. You learn the, uh, the integrity, excellence, and you learn how to get along with your coworkers and, and your superiors. And it, it was a very, very uh, teaching experience. So I think the actual experience just helped me to, to mature and grow and perhaps lead me eventually to some direction. Been more good than bad. Um, I did get injured and I got new parts, my legs. <laughs> there's, there's certain times and places uh, in the military that I can just close my eyes and I can be there. And the smells and, and even some of the sounds can, can, can be there. I ended up uh, being diagnosed with PTSD. These are the parts that get hurt. So I've been, uh, since 1998, uh, I've been 100% PTSD and I do a lot of counseling um, and that affected basically my career as a funeral director. I, I had to get out at that point and, uh, and like I said, that was after 35 years. And I still, I still miss working with the families as far as doing arrangements because uh, I always, I guess I kind of enjoyed that working and helping somebody else out. but uh, it. Took a toll on my, um, actually my career, my family, you know, so. Uh. Thanks to the military, I went to college. I got a college degree and I had a good job with the Department of the Navy, ironically. Uh, I worked for a commander who became a captain. Uh, again, military, uh, but I was a civilian, so it was okay, you know. Uh, there won't be any veterans coming home to the welcome that we 
we got or we didn't get ever how you want to how you want to look at it. I mean, we a lot of the guys, I didn't have spirits, but a lot of guys got spat on, a lot of guys got called all kinds of names. Uh, in the last probably uh, three to four years, I, I've met up with uh, one, two, probably a half dozen guys that I actually worked with in Vietnam. So, uh, and, and it's only been, I've seen one of them, the rest of them has only been on the telephone, uh, but they're, I'm planning on coming to a reunion this year, which is going to be in about two weeks. So um, I'm looking forward to that. You know, so. If you've lived these places, you know that we are so interconnected. Uh, the world is, and I just don't mean electronically, uh, events are interconnected. I think that's what it has given me. And uh, a great appreciation for other cultures. Other people have good ways of doing things and good food. I'm so, I'm so impressed with the, today's military because the, the level of training they've got and the, the equipment they got is so, much, so many light years ahead of you know, what we had you know, back in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. I think that uh, the current military is not a lot different than it was back when I joined. The young people uh, want to learn, they want to participate, and they want to be as good as they can. Every, every conflict is different. Um, certainly they have technology that we never even dreamed of. Um, but still, they're over there serving and it concerns me with the problems that many of them have when they return. And all I can do is say a prayer and wish them the best. I won't say I think they have it easy, but uh, it's a lot different than when I was in. You know, I, I remember talking to somebody who was at a reunion who was an active duty guy, and they were talking about their PT and putting their shorts on and sneakers. And, go out and do that and then come back and take their showers and well, what are you talking about? I mean, we got in our fatigues, you do your breakfast or whatever, you do your PT and you just went to work. You didn't go back to re get re-cleaned up or anything like that. So it's a lot different now. They're soldiers, uh, no matter what branch, and using soldier as a, a generic term. They're following orders. They're protecting us and they're keeping us safe and they're keeping us where we have the freedom that we've enjoyed today. Only half of 1% of the people in America wear the uniform and they're protecting all of us. No one should be pro-war, but you ought to be pro-America. To those who are serving, I would say thank you. Uh, you're doing something very important for our country. And for those who may consider military service, I would say that if you decide to do that, you're doing something very important for us all and wish them well. Those who wish to serve, if they want to serve, they will serve and they will do okay. Make the most of it. It's, it's an exciting time of your life. It's uh, lessons that will stand you in good stead. Um, and Cherish the people you're with because many of them you'll never see again. Friendships that I've made in the service of, of people that are no longer around, uh, I miss them. I'd like, to, I'd like to sit down and talk to them again. To those who are thinking of it, explore all options, but it's a good life.